once again, good evening. Welcome. Thanks for coming out on this rainy night. My name is Barbara Altman, and I'm the director of the Oregon Humanities Center, the sponsor of tonight's event. I'm honored this evening to introduce Professor Kwame Anthony Appiah, Lawrence S. Rockefeller University Professor of Philosophy at Princeton University, and our 2009-2010 SEDEC Professor in the Humanities. We have kept Professor Appiah very busy. He taped an interview with me for UO Today this afternoon and then led an informal seminar for faculty and graduate students. And tomorrow we will all go to Portland. We're going to take the show on the road. And he will do a second SEDEC lecture in Portland at the UO White Stag Building titled A Life of Honor. Appiah is first and foremost a philosopher whose interests include moral, social, and political philosophy as well as African and African American studies. After an early book on assertion and conditionals and work on semantics, he has turned more to issues of personal and political identity, multiculturalism, and nationalism. Appiah has authored numerous scholarly works, a great many articles, and three novels, and he has edited 19 other volumes. Titles you might be familiar with are In My Father's House, Africa in the Philosophy of Culture from 1992, the Ethics of Identity, 2006, and Experiments in Ethics, 2008. His highly acclaimed book from 2006, Cosmopolitanism, Ethics in a World of Strangers, has been translated into 15 languages, including Portuguese, Chinese, Dutch, Greek, Hebrew, Indonesian, Korean, Romanian, and Turkish. I take that as proof that the notion of cosmopolitanism which argues that individuals should seek an identity as, as a citizen of the world in order to be responsive to the need of others, but without denying their own heritage or community, holds broad appeal across many parts of the world. His newest book, which will be out shortly, um, is titled The Honor Code, How Moral Revolutions Happen. Both cosmopolitanism and the honor code have garnered great praise as brilliant work, and I quote, Honor Code is called an indispensable book for both moral philosophers and honorable citizens. That's from Walter Isaacson. With that kind of a profile, Apia is an excellent fit for our annual Tzedek Lectureship in the Humanities. The endowment for this yearly lectureship was established in 1996 with a generous gift from steadfast donors to the center. The title is a reference to the Hebrew word for righteousness or justice, and the professorship is intended to bring someone who is both a scholar and a practitioner, a thinker and a doer, someone who makes personal ethical responsibility to others the focus of his or her work. We invited Apia to be this year's Tzedek lecturer because in addition to his published work on personal responsibility, he is also the president since last year of the Penn American Center. To quote from the Penn website, the American Center is the U.S. branch of the world's oldest international literary and human rights organization. International Penn was founded in 1921 in direct response to the ethnic and national divisions that contributed to the First World War. Penn American Center was founded in 1922 and is the largest of the 144 Penn centers in 101 countries that together compose International Penn. Pan American Center comprises 3,400 professional members who represent the most distinguished writers, translators, and editors in the United States. Throughout its 85-year history, Pan American Center has remained a writer-centered organization in which members play a leading role. After more than a decade of involvement as a member, Apia is now the latest in a long line of high-profile Pan presidents, including Arthur Miller, Norman Mailer, Susan Sontag, and Salman Rushdie, all of whom have continued the struggle to oppose censorship and defend writers. It was especially on the basis of his work with Penn that we asked Professor Appiah to be the concluding speaker in our Year of the Book series this year, a series that has included discussions of new technologies in book production, the challenge for libraries in the age of digitization, issues of access to knowledge through documents and knowledge as power, as well as historical, artistic, and literary concerns of books. We wanted to bring this home with a consideration on freedom of written expression in its broadest lines. And Professor Appiah was good enough to, degree, to agree to deliver that kind of a wrap up for us, one that will leave us thinking after a year long, intellectually invigorating series of events. 
Let me take just a moment while I have the mic to look ahead to next year. Our central theme next year will be sustenance. And we have our logo ready. This is the sustenance logo. You will remember the one for year of the book. Our designer, Peg, has come up with something equally wonderful for next year, so watch for this. Uh, we, you will see this logo on all of our associated events. We hope once again to partner with many units across campus to engage the theme. And we've already booked our first major speaker. Terry Tempest Williams will be here on November 2nd. If you like this event and wish to attend more, I invite you to add your name to our mailing list. We have the information table just outside the doors. And you can check out our website for a full calendar of events. Finally, before handing over to Professor Apia, I would be remiss if I didn't deliver a few thank yous, especially now as we wrap up what has been a very, very busy year. My job as director is to put a public face on the center and its events, but the really hard work is done by others. Many thanks, therefore, to the staff of the Oregon Humanities Center, to Peg Gearhart, who designs our striking publicity materials and produces our TV show, to Melissa Gustafson, who handles all the event planning and much more, to Lindsay Hendrickson, who handles the front office, our student worker, Ty, who tapes and pins up hundreds and thousands of posters, and especially to Julia Hayden, our associate director, who is the linchpin at the center of everything we do. Now, with no further ado, please help me welcome Kwame Anthony Apia. Well, thank you very much for that very generous introduction. And um, I am going to talk about uh, the work of Penn. But I want to begin, if I may, by just um, saying a little bit about who I am and uh, how I came to do this work. Um, so my, my, my mother was born in the west of England, uh, on the edge of the Cotswold Hills, a very beautiful part of England to a family that traced its uh, roots back in a 50-mile radius to the uh, Norman period, early, uh, some eight centuries earlier. And my father was born in Kumasi, the capital of the Ashanti region of Ghana, in a city where he could trace his ancestry back for more than three centuries, back to around the beginnings of the Ashanti kingdom at the turn of the 18th century. So when these two people, born so far apart, married, in the 1950s in Great Britain, many people warned them that a mixed marriage was going to be difficult. And my parents agreed because my father was a Methodist and my mother was an Anglican. <laughs> and they thought that that would be a real challenge. After all, as Anglicans like to point out, John Wesley, founding father of Methodism, once said, if the Methodists leave the Church of England, I fear that God will leave the Methodists. It's a bit odd to have a founder who said that about you. So I'm the product of this mixed marriage, baptized a Methodist, educated at Anglican schools. I went to Sunday school, perhaps ridiculously, at a non-denominational church of which my mother was a member. St. George's was her church. She was a member and an elder of it for more than 50 years. But her funeral was celebrated at the Methodist Cathedral. It tells you something about my hometown that there is a Methodist Cathedral of which my father and grandfather were elders, the church where I was baptized, though, of course, the minister of her church and the Catholic archbishop were among the officiating clergy. These were all my mother's choices. She thought about her funeral well before she died. And if you'd asked her what denomination she had belonged to all those years, she would have said that she belonged to the Church of Christ and that the rest was a lot of unimportant details. So much, then, for the challenge of mixed marriages, at least in Ghana. So I'm a child of that mother and that church. I learned Christianity and its moral ideas from them. But I also learned something else from both my parents, something they exemplified when they decided to become man and wife. And that was a kind of openness to people and cultures beyond the ones they were raised in. My mother got this, I think, from her parents, who had friends in many continents at a time when many English people were extremely provincial. Some of you may think that English people are still provincial, but certainly in the 1930s, when my mother was a child uh, in the west of England, it wasn't common to have Indians and Jamaicans uh, visiting your house. My father learned it as uh, much as anything else, I think, from Kumasi, the city where he was born and I grew up, 
which like many old capital cities is a multicultural polyglot place open to the world. But he got it as well from his schooling because like many of those who had the rare opportunity to get a secondary school education in the far-flung reaches of the British Empire before the Second World War, my father was educated in the classics. He loved Latin. He would have been delighted that he's had two grandsons who'd studied um, classics at Cambridge and another one at Oxford. By his bedside, he kept not only his Bible, but the works of Cicero and Marcus Aurelius, followers both of the sort of stoicism that was central to the intellectual and moral life of the Roman Empire by the first century when Christianity was beginning to spread through the Hellenistic world of the Eastern Empire. In his spiritual testament to us, the document that he left for us when he died, uh, my sisters and I, he told us that we should always remember that we were citizens of the world. He used those exact words. Words that Marcus Aurelius would certainly have recognized and agreed with. Marcus Aurelius, after all, wrote, how close is the kinship between a man and the whole human race, for it is a community not of a little blood or seed, but of the spirit. My mother's commitments were more literary than philosophical. She was a writer, and she began her literary career with books that aimed to make the lives of people in Asante, where we lived, accessible to children in England and America. I believe that her Tales of an Asante Father is still in print, uh, which was published first in the 1960s. The first of them, the first of these books, uh, Tales of an Asante Father, was appropriately named because it was based on the retelling of Asante folk tales tales that my sisters and I had learned from our father, and my mother had learned by overhearing him telling them to us. And, but then she went on to write uh, stories about contemporary children in Ghana and finally to write novels for about uh, Ghanaian life. Her other job when I was a child was to run the office of a lawyer and politician since my father practiced law and was a member of the first parliament after independence. She'd grown up in the house of another parliamentarian because her own father and grandfather and two of her great uncles were members of the British Parliament. So in some respects, she had a good idea of what it would be like to be uh, married to a member of Parliament. But her experience in England hadn't prepared her for one aspect of the life of an opposition member of Parliament in the early years after independence in Ghana, which she had to deal with when the president, whom she'd first met as one of her future husband's friends, decided when I was about seven that he would lock up some of his political opponents without bothering with the formality of trying them for a crime. As a result, my mother found herself having to look after her family and try to seek support for her imprisoned husband in a country where she was a stranger. In that difficult period, my sisters and I and my mother learned a couple of important lessons. One was that when you're threatened by the government, you don't know where you will find your friends. Many ordinary people whom we didn't know at all sent us their gifts and their good wishes. Many people we thought were our friends disappeared when the going got tough. And I'm glad to say that one great source of solace throughout this time was my father's extended family, and another was my mother's church. But a second thing we learned was that my father's view that we were citizens of the world was shared by many people in other countries who heard about what had happened to us and who wrote to their governments and to our government demanding that my father and his friends be released. If you haven't had this experience, it's probably hard to appreciate how uplifting it is when your father is imprisoned and your family is threatened with deportation from the only home you've ever known, to discover that all around the world, in Australia, in other parts of Africa, in Britain and North America, there are people who are on your side. These people thought of us as their fellows, even though we weren't citizens of one country and they treated us as fellow citizens of the human community. There's a simple story about how this happened. We were lucky. Amnesty International had just been founded when my father was arrested, and they happened to make their first mission to Ghana. So much of that support from the world was organized by them because my father was one of Amnesty's first prisoners of conscience. So this background and these experiences are part of the reason that I'm so committed to the work of the Pan American Center whose president I have the honor of being. And so proud too, and so engaged with the work of the other 145 Penn centers in more than 100 countries around the world. Because Penn, like Amnesty, was founded on the principle that building links across nations is one way to build the possibility of peace 
between nations. The first pen club was founded in London in 1921, when, uh, and uh, John Goldsworthy um, was the first president. I'm sure you know he was a British playwright and novelist, but his best known work these days is probably the Foresight Saga, which was made into a very long-running television program. Penn's first members included Joseph Conrad, George Bernard Shaw, and H.G. Wells. These writers came together in the shadow of the Great War in response to the threat to civilization and to human decency posed by the slaughter on the battlefields of Europe. Their aim was to build international literary fellowship and, as they said, to defend literature against the many threats to its survival which the modern world poses. And they were inspired by the idea that if the writers of all nations could bring, build links of friendship through their shared concern for literature, the nations of which they were citizens could come closer to friendship too. So a year later, the American Penn Center came into being. Over the years, Penn American Center's membership has included many of this country's leading American lights, James Baldwin, Willa Cather, Robert Frost, Langston Hughes, Thomas Mann, uh, it's a wonderful fact about this country that many of our great writers weren't born here. Arthur Miller, Marianne Moore, Susan Sontag, Paul Oster, Salman Rushdie. That's a great fact about this country that many of our important writers weren't born here. And uh, John Steinbeck. Since 1960, International Pen's Writers in Prison Community, Committee has worked on behalf of persecuted writers worldwide alongside our Freedom to Write Committee here in the United States. So this is, roughly speaking, the 50th anniversary of Penn's activism on behalf of writers who are jailed or face persecution because of their work. Joseph Brodsky, Ole Shoyinka, Vladislav Havel, José Ruvueltas, Ramodia Nanta Toer, Alicia Portnoy, Salman Rushdie, Orhan Pamuk, and Taslima Nazreen are just a few of the hundreds of writers Penn has freed or defended over the years, or helped to free. Well, as the son of a writer mother and a father who was a political prisoner, uh, three times eventually, but that's another story, uh, as the child of these parents who believe passionately in world citizenship as well as in patriotic devotion to the country where they lived, I can't help but be impassioned by the work of an organization that has at its heart working to protect free expression everywhere, in part by campaigning for the freedom of writers imprisoned for what they have written. But if my commitments were merely personal, rooted only in my own particular history, I couldn't commend them to those of you whose experiences are different from mine. So I want today to argue for two ideas together, that, that together offer, I think, everyone a reason to care about the sort of work Penn does. The first idea is that ideal of world citizenship that I learned from my parents. And the second, is the importance of free expression, not just in journalism and political writing, but also in the life of the imagination. So those are the two themes of what I want to say today, and let me start with world citizenship. This idea actually has a long history in Western philosophy. The grand name for it is cosmopolitanism, a word whose etymology is Greek, even though the man who probably coined the term came, like so many of the traditions of the West, from Asia Minor. Because the earliest figure I know of who said he was a citizen of the world, a cosmopolites in Greek, which is where our word comes from, was a man named Diogenes. Diogenes was, the, was a philosopher. Everybody in those days who said anything was a philosopher, uh, uh, unless they were a king or a general. Um, and he was the founder of the philosophical movement that was later called cynicism, which is not to be confused with the official ideology of the American high school. <laughs> he was born sometime in the late 5th century in Sinope, on the southern coast of the Black Sea in what is now Turkey. The cynics rejected tradition and local loyalty and generally opposed what everybody else thought of as civilized behavior. Diogenes himself lived, tradition reports, in a large terracotta pot. It is said that he did what my English nanny would have called his business in public. And if you don't know what my English nanny would have called his business, she certainly wouldn't have wanted me to explain to you. <laughs> he also did what Hugh Hefner has made his business in public too. So he was, in short, a sort of 4th century BCE performance artist. 
And he was called a cynic, kines in Greek means doggy, because he lived like a dog. So the cynics are just the doggy philosophers, and not surprisingly, he was kicked out of Sinope. But as I say, for better or worse, Diogenes is also the first person who's reported to have said that he was a citizen of the world. Now, this has to be a metaphor, of course, because citizens share a state, a polis, and there isn't a world state, and there wasn't. There wasn't a cosmopolis for Diogenes to be a citizen of. And so, like anyone who adopts the metaphor of world citizenship, he had to decide how to make it work, what to mean by it. One thing he didn't mean was that he favored a single world government. He once met someone who did, a fellow by the name of Alexander of Macedon, Alexander the Great, who favored, as you know, government of the world by Alexander of Macedon, <laughs> and almost achieved it. The story goes that Alexander came across Diogenes one sunny day. It's important that it was sunny. This time, not in his usual terracotta pot, but resting for a moment in a hole in the ground. The Macedonian world conqueror, who as Aristotle's student had been brought up to respect philosophers, asked Diogenes if there was anything he could do for him. And Diogenes' famous reply was, sure, you can get out of my light. <laughs> now, so Diogenes made it plain that he wasn't a fan of Alexander's or of his project of world domination, which, by the way, probably upset Alexander because one of Alexander's sayings that has come down to us is, if I hadn't been Alexander, I would have liked to have been Diogenes. <laughs> so it must have been a bit disappointing if he thought that, to meet Diogenes and find him saying to you, just get out of my light, you're standing between me and the sun. So anyway, the first thing I want to take from Diogenes in interpreting the metaphor of global citizenship is you don't need world government, not even by a student of Aristotle's. We can think of ourselves, Diogenes wanted to say, as fellow citizens, even if we aren't and don't want to be, members of a single political community subject to a single unitary government. A second idea we can take from Diogenes is that we should care about the fate of all our fellow human beings, not just the ones in our own political community. Just as within your community, you should care about every one of your fellow citizens, so in the world as a whole, you should care for your fellow world citizens. And furthermore, and this is a third idea from Diogenes, you can borrow good ideas from all over the world, not just from within your own society. It's worth listening to others because they may have something to teach, and it's worth them listening to us because we may have something to teach to them. Now, we don't have writings from Diogenes, partly, I suspect, because, like Socrates, he believed that conversation, which goes both ways and in which you learn as well as teach, is a better way of communicating than writing messages to people who can't answer back, which is the privilege of a writer. So that's a final thing I want to borrow from him, the value of dialogue or conversation as a fundamental mode of human activity. So these three ideas, I, a 21st century American citizen of Anglo-Ghanaian ancestry, want to borrow from a citizen of Sinope who dreamed of global citizenship 24 centuries ago. One, we don't need a world government, but two, we must care nevertheless for the fate of all human beings inside and outside our own societies. And three, we have much to gain from conversation with one another across our many differences. Now, globalization has made this ancient ideal relevant, which it wasn't exactly in Aurelius or Diogenes' day. Because there are two obvious conditions on making citizenship real. You have to know about the lives of other citizens, on the one hand, and you have to have the power to affect them, on the other. And Diogenes didn't know about most people in China and Japan, in South America, in equatorial Africa, even in Western or Northern Europe. And nothing he did was likely to have much impact on them, at least so far as he knew, either. And the fact is, as I say, you can't give real meaning to the idea that we're all fellow citizens unless we can affect each other and unless we can know about one another. But we don't live in Diogenes' world. In the last few centuries, every human community has gradually been drawn into a single web of trade and a global network of information. And we've come to a point where each of us can realistically imagine contacting any of our other six or seven billion fellow humans and sending that person something worth having, a radio or an antibiotic or a good idea. Unfortunately, we can also now send, uh, through negligence or malice, things that will cause harm. We can send those anywhere, too. We can send a virus or an airborne pollutant 
or perhaps worst of all, a bad idea. And the possibilities of good and ill are multiplied beyond measure when it comes to policies carried out by our governments in our names. Together, we can ruin farmers by dumping our subsidized grain into foreign markets, cripple industries by punitive tariffs, and deliver weapons that will kill thousands, if not millions. But also, together, we can raise standards of living around the world by adopting new policies on trade and aid, prevent or treat diseases with vaccines and pharmaceuticals, and take measures against global climate change, as well as encouraging resistance to tyranny and a concern for the worth of each human life. So the existence of global media means we can now know about one another, and our global interconnections, economic, political, military, and ecological, mean that not only we can, but we inevitably will affect each other. So now we really need a cosmopolitan spirit. It was merely invented a couple of millennia too early. That spirit thinks of us all as bound together across the species, but also accepts that we will make different choices within and across nations about how it is best to make one's life. Because cosmopolitans value cultural diversity because of what it makes possible for individual women and men. At the heart of modern cosmopolitanism is respect for diversity of culture, not so much because cultures matter in themselves, but because people matter, and culture matters to people. So if culture is bad for people, if culture is bad for individual men and women and children, the cosmopolitan has no reason to be tolerant of it. We do not need to treat genocide or human rights abuses as another part of the quaint diversity of the species. And of course, the, local, the, the world wide web of information, radio, television, telephones, and the internet, means not only that we can affect lives everywhere, but as I said, that we can learn about life anywhere too. Each person you know about and can affect is someone to whom you have responsibilities. To say that is just to affirm the idea of morality. The challenge is to take minds and hearts formed over the long millennia of living in local troops and equip us with ideas and institutions that will allow us to live together as the global tribe we have become. And we should begin by insisting that cosmopolitanism is, as I've said, a double-stranded tradition. It is, in a slogan, universality plus difference. Now, I've said something already about why cosmopolitans uh, accept the wide range of legitimate human diversity, but I want to be more explicit. Why, after all, shouldn't we do, in the name of universal concern, what missionaries of many faiths have done? Why shouldn't we just go into the world, guided by the truth, and help other people to live by it, too? Well, one reason is that cosmopolitans share from our Greek forefathers a recognition of the fallibility of human claims to knowledge. Cosmopolitanism begins with the philosophical doctrine of fallibilism, the recognition that we may be mistaken even when we have looked carefully at the evidence and applied our highest mental capacities, uh, uh, which we cannot be guaranteed to do. That is, we cannot be guaranteed to look carefully at the evidence and apply our highest mental capacities, but even when we do, that doesn't guarantee that we'll get the right answer. A fallibilist knows that he or she is likely to make mistakes. We have views. We take our views seriously. We're not skeptics. But we're always open to the possibility that it may turn out that we're wrong. And if I'm wrong about something, then I can learn from others, even if they will be wrong about something else. But there's a second reason one whose roots are in a more modern idea, the idea that each human being is charged with ultimate responsibility for her own life. The dignity of human beings resides in part in their capacity for and right to self-management. And because of this, it's important that human beings live by standards they themselves believe in, even if the standards they believe in are wrong. As John Stuart Mill put it on, in On Liberty some one and a half centuries ago, this is a wonderful piece of Victorian English. If a person possesses any tolerable amount of common sense and experience, his own mode of laying out his existence is best, not because it is best in itself, but because it is his own mode. It's best when people live by ideals they themselves believe in. If I force a man to do what I take to be right when he doesn't think it's right, or stop a woman from doing what I take to be wrong when she doesn't agree that it's wrong, I'm not always making their lives better. Of course, if the wrong someone is doing harms others, I may have to stop you anyway, 
because the universal concern that underlies cosmopolitanism means that it matters to me as it should matter to everyone, that each human life should go well. But if a person is of sound mind and the wrong she's planning to do affects only her own fate, then the right way to express my concern for her is not to force her to do the right thing, but to try to persuade her that she's mistaken. Still, because cosmopolitanism is fallibilist, cosmopolitan conversation across cultural and political and social and economic and religious boundaries is not about wholesale conversion. It's about learning as well as about teaching. It's about listening as well as talking. Even when I'm trying to persuade someone that what they see as right is wrong, I'm hearing their arguments that what I think is wrong is right. Now, global conversation is a metaphor. It needs interpretation, just as the metaphor of global citizenship needs interpreting. Those of you with advanced math degrees can figure out how many conversations we'd have to have for all of the six or seven billion on people on the planet to have a conversation with each other. But a global community of cosmopolitans will consist of people who want to learn about other ways of life through anthropology and history, through novels and movies, through news stories in newspapers, on radio and television, and on the web. Indeed, let me make my first entirely concrete practical proposal. Practical for anyone with a Netflix account. Do what people all around the world are already doing with American movies. See at least one movie with subtitles a month. But in remaining open to the global, the cosmopolitanism I'm defending does not require you to abandon the local. After all, what makes those foreign movies worth seeing is the fact that they are the product of a particular place with its own distinctions and differences. Cosmopolitanism needs the local because that is where the difference it celebrates lives. It would be a strange creed that celebrated the product of the local in others but declined to respect the local at home. So you do not need to abjure all local allegiances and partialities in the name of the vast abstraction of humanity. Some of the past proponents of cosmopolitanism were inclined to think that, and they made easy targets of ridicule. A lover of his kind, but a hater of his kindred, Edmund Burke said about Rousseau, who handed each of the five children he fathered to an orphanage, you will recall. But the impartialist version of the cosmopolitan creed holds a kind of steely fascination. Virginia Woolf once exhorted freedom from unreal loyalties to nation, sex, school, neighborhood. Tolstoy, in the same spirit, inveighed against the stupidity of patriotism. To destroy war, destroy patriotism, he wrote in 1896, a couple of decades before the Tsar was swept away by a revolution in the name of the international working class. Some contemporary philosophers have similarly urged that the boundaries of nations are morally irrelevant, accidents of history with no rightful claim on our conscience. I am not with them. But if there are friends of cosmopolitanism like these who make me nervous, nervous, I'm happy to be opposed to cosmopolitanism's noisiest enemies. Both Hitler and Stalin, who agreed about nothing else, save that murder is the first instrument of politics, launched regular invectives against what they called rootless cosmopolitans. And while for both, anti-cosmopolitanism was often just a euphemism for anti-Semitism, they were right to see cosmopolitanism as their enemy. Because both of them required a kind of loyalty to one portion of humanity, a nation or a class, that ruled out loyalty to all of humanity. And the one thought that cosmopolitans share is that no local loyalty can ever justify forgetting that each human being has responsibilities to every other. But we don't have to take sides with the nationalist who abandons all foreigners, nor with the hardcore cosmopolitanism that regards friends and fellow citizens with the icy impartiality of Virginia Woolf. The position worth defending might be called a partial cosmopolitanism. There's a lovely passage, I think, to this point in George Eliot's novel, Daniel Deronda, published in 1876, which was, as it happens, the year when England's first and so far last Jewish prime minister, Benjamin Disraeli, was elevated to the House of Lords as Earl of Beaconsfield. Disraeli, though baptized and brought up in the Church of England, always had a proud consciousness of his Jewish ancestry, which given his name, it would have been hard to ignore. If your name is D Israeli, it's kind of hard to forget that you have Jewish ancestry. But Deronda, who has been raised in England as a Christian gentleman, Deronda, of course, is also Jewish, 
discovers his Jewish ancestry only as an adult. And his response to, is to commit himself to the furtherance, as he says, of his hereditary people. And now let me read a passage from George Eliot. It was as if he had found an added soul in finding his ancestry, his judgment no longer wandering in the mazes of impartial sympathy, but choosing with the noble partiality which is man's best strength, the closer fellowship that makes sympathy practical, exchanging the bird's eye reasonableness which soars to avoid preference and loses all sense of quality for the generous reasonableness of drawing shoulder to shoulder with men of like inheritance. Notice that in claiming a Jewish loyalty, an added soul, Deronda is not rejecting his human identity. As he says to his mother, I think it would have been right that I should have been brought up with the consciousness that I was a Jew, but it must always have been a good to me to have as wide an instruction and sympathy as possible. This is the same Deronda who earlier explained his decision to study outside England, before he knew he was of Jewish ancestry, in these eminently cosmopolitan terms. I want to be an Englishman, but I want to understand other points of view, and I want to get rid of a merely English attitude in studies. I love that, a merely English attitude in studies. So loyalties and local allegiances determine more than what we want. They determine who we are. And Eliot's talk of the closer fellowship that makes sympathy practical echoes the long ago claim uh, of Cicero's that society and human fellowship will be best served if we confer the most kindness of those on whom we are most closely associated. A creed that disdains the partialities of kinfolk and community has no future. Cosmopolitanism begins with a respect for roots, which is one reason I was happy to begin myself by telling you something of the places in England and in Ghana that produced the cosmopolitan who stands here today. But having come this far with my first idea, the idea of world citizenship, you will see that I've already strayed into the range of the second. Because I've just drawn attention to the role of the imagination in the movies and in novels like Daniel Deronda in shaping our consciousness as global citizens. But it's important to place the role of literature in the life of free men and women in the broader context of all forms of expression. I'm going to go briefly, br briskly through what I think are the four fundamental philosophical reasons for insisting on the importance of all forms of free expression. The first is the basic thought that a commitment to political freedom requires us always to begin with the presumption that the government shouldn't stop people doing, and in particular saying and writing, whatever they like, unless there is a persuasive reason to stop them. Absent a reason, you should be allowed to do what you like. That's what it is to believe in freedom as a fundamental idea. <coughs> Free people should only be stopped from doing things for reasons, ideally reasons they can understand. A second ground for a concern for free expression, which is uh, more specific to expression, one that was made much of in John Stuart Mill's On Liberty, which I've quoted already, is that free debate is the best way, the only way we know, perhaps, of finding the truth. And truth, in case you haven't noticed, is usually better than the alternative. And the third reason, one that is centrally important in understanding why literary freedom matters, the freedom of writers, is that in writing or speaking, we express ourselves. Our words are, as it were, an extension of who we are. A life in which you are denied expression is a life in which you can't be fully who you are. And the fourth reason is that all of us can benefit from what we learn from the works that are produced in a free society. Readers can learn from writing not only what they need to know to make decisions about how to pursue their goals, they can learn, especially through literature and the imagination, about what goals are worth pursuing. Now these reasons for caring about free expression have to do with why it matters for individuals because a government that doesn't allow its people to speak, but, but it matters very much for, for politics too, because a government that doesn't allow its people to speak can't learn what most concerns them. And since government should always be not just of the people, but for the people, without that knowledge, it cannot perform its tasks. In a democracy, which is a government by the people, this knowledge is important to every citizen, because without the discourse of a free society, we cannot carry out our most basic responsibility as citizens, 
which is to evaluate and select who shall govern. And in serving all these functions, literature, not just journalism, not just uh, nonfiction, but fiction, poetry, the novel, the short story, um, and so on, the movies, are absolutely crucial. This year, we at Penn gave our Freedom to Write Award to a young Burmese writer named Mae Pone Lat. One of the most powerful works of the imagination that he's written is a poem about the monks' uprising in Burma a couple of years ago that expresses in the sort of condensed language that is central to poetry the longings for political freedom of so many in his generation in his country. I, it's a long poem. Let me just read you a bit of it in a, in a translation that we had done for us. I won't cry, mother. On the nights I closed all the doors, turned off all the lights, and stepped quietly. I sighed, asking myself, what mistakes had I made? The first day next to the road, enveloped by the echoes of love, covered by the monks, I put my hands together with tears, my legs still pulled back by fear, mother. The second day, with bare feet in the wind and rain, where love overflowed the youth and people surrounding the golden-colored stream, a new Irrawaddy flowed on the road. That day, I became the Irrawaddy mother. That's the river that goes through Rangoon. Let's forget about guns that are not to shoot into the air, bamboo batons not for display, mother. One sure thing is, however much they kill, however many people die, the Irrawaddy on the road will forever be flowing in our hearts. So he's this image of the, the monks as like um, the flowing of the Irrawaddy River through, through their country, which is often uh, sort of reddish, like the monks' robes are red. Um, that was translated by Tan Tan Nguyen. We believe deeply in translation, and I never read anything in translation without saying who translated it. Um, so uh, um, for, for young Burmese, and, and Ne Pon Lat was sentenced mostly for being a blogger, but, for, but he's also a poet, and his, the fact that his response to the, uh, the crackdown on the monks in his own country was not just to blog about it, but to express himself through poetry is part of what's lost if you lose the place of the imagination in the life, uh, in the life of a, of, in the political life of a country or of the world. But um, of course, uh, journalism matters too. In the post-war period in the Soviet Union, it was literature that spoke for the people's desire to end that form of tyranny. Think of Solzhenitsyn. But since the end of the Soviet Union in the new Russia. It's more often been through the voices of brave, independent journalists that Russia's conscience has spoken. Uh, people like Anna Politkovskaya, who covered Russian conduct in Chechnya, who was murdered on October 7, 2006. Two years later, on the anniversary of her death, Natalia Stemirova, one of the small, brave company of Russian journalists who continued her work, received the first Anna Politkovskaya Award from the human rights group Reach All Women in War. But in July 2009, Natalia Estemirova herself was murdered, her bullet-ridden body dumped far from her home in, in the province of Ingushetia. The decimation of Russia's independent investigative journalists matters not just to Russians, but to all of us. For Russia is now supposed to be a democracy, a partner in the, globing, in the growing global community of democratic nations. And a democracy whose citizens are denied the basic information necessary to judge the actions of its leaders lacks exactly what they need to do their job. We're often told that the Russian government's uh, policies in Chechnya have been popular. But you can't hold Russia's citizens responsible for what Russia does unless they know what their country is actually doing. And without a free press, the Russian people can't know that. It's easier to find out what's going on in Chechnya and New York than it is in Moscow. Democratic choices made in ignorance are not free, but fixed. And the freedom of writers to investigate and to write about life in their own societies is important above all, because it, without it, readers lose their freedom too. So that's why Penn American Center cares about free expression here at home, as well as around the world, and why we fought to stop the rollback of fundamental protections in the aftermath of 9-11 in our own country. Our international links and our battles here at home give us the bona fides to speak as we do now 
about free expression everywhere from Iran to Burma to Uzbekistan to Turkey to China. I want to end with a story about a Chinese writer. On Christmas Day, Liu Xiaobo, writer, human rights activist, and former president of the Independent Chinese Pen Center, one of our colleague organizations in China, was sentenced to 11 years in prison for seven, writing seven published sentences, just 224 characters of Chinese. In their official verdict, the Beijing court cited all the exact passages from his writings that were judged to be subversive. Two of them came from Charter 08, a manifesto calling for democratic reforms in China, a manifesto he helped to write and which has been signed by hundreds of other brave Chinese men and women. 30 years after Charter 77, the Czech Charter of Freedoms, signed by Václav Havel. So what did we do? Well, a week later, on New Year's Eve, he was sentenced, as I said, on Christmas Day, we brought together writers, American writers, members of the Pan American Center, on the steps of the New York Public Library, in the snow, as it happened, to protest and to read translations of those 224 characters. We took a, a letter to the Chinese legation, to the UN, addressed to the Chinese president. We wrote to our own ambassador in Beijing, asking him to speak to the Chinese government on his behalf. Uh, I went on television to talk to CNN International in Hong Kong, which is broadcast into China about his case. Uh, we nominated him for the Nobel Peace Prize. We sent a colleague to meet with his wife. And we asked our own president to bring the matter up in his meetings with the Chinese and uh, to keep drawing the Chinese government's attention to the fact that we care about his case. So we want him to know, as my father knew, as we knew when uh, he was in prison many years ago, that he's not forgotten. We want, the, uh, we want him to know that, and we want the government to know that his case will be a constant irritation in their relations with the United States and the many other countries whose pen centers have protested. When we sent those letters, Norwegian pen was sending letters, South African pen was sending letters, and so on. And we care about this in the deeper sense because we care about China's great literary traditions and China's voice. We want China to be heard in the community of nations. We want the Chinese to be able to hear the latest uh, in the voice of their own traditions. So let me read you now a poem, uh, another translated poem, this, uh, by Lu Xiaobo, uh, dedicated to his wife. This was written the last time, the last time he was a political prisoner. It's called Daybreak, and it's for Jia. Jia is his wife. Over the tall ashen wall, between the sound of vegetables being dropped, chopped, Daybreak's bound, severed, dissipated by a paralysis of spirit. What is the difference between the light and the darkness that seems to surface through my eyes' apertures? From my seat of rust, I can't tell if it's the glint of chains in the cell or the god of nature behind the wall. Daily dissidence makes the arrogant sun stunned to no end. Daybreak, a vast emptiness, you in a far place with nights of love stored away. That was translated by Jeffrey Yang. As my friend and pen colleague Ed Doctorow said on the steps of the New York Public Library in the snow on New Year's Eve that day, such events of this have been necessary for as long as I can remember. Pen members marched around the Czech embassy to protect the jailing of Václav Havel. 20 years ago, we rose in judgment against the fatwa applied to Salman Rushdie. And this is the key sentence. The attack is always directed to the creative mind. So our work at Penn, I believe, is a good example of what it means, not in theory, but in practice, to conceive of ourselves as global citizens. The life of the imagination, the writer's life, depends on crossing boundaries. But we cosmopolitans believe that there is a magic power in crossing boundaries wherever you live and whatever your vocation. Thank you very much.
you'd like to ask a question, could we ask you to come to one of the microphones in the aisles, please? That way we can make sure to capture your question on the recording of the talk. If you cannot come to the mic, we will bring one to you. Somebody told me that Oregonians were shy. <laughs> Professor Appiah, can you hear me? Thank you very much. Um, one of the places today where writers get killed uh, is in Mexico, in light of the, the war on drugs, right, the crackdown there. Uh, it seems like the examples you were presenting in defense of writers works well uh, in places where there's, there's an you know, effective state, where the government has some control. But in places where corruption is rampant and you have cartels that have a lot of influence, what has been the success or what work has been done or what are your thoughts on something like that, you know, right, you know dangers of, of writers in a place like, you know, drug Mexico? Um, so the, the uh, remember I said that when Penn was founded, um, the, they talked about the threats to free expression, to, to literature in the world today. And the threats to expression, of course, don't just come from government repression. Uh, some of them come from uh, I, I, the, the, the concentration of, of media control. Uh, that's one of the problems in the Soviet Union. I mean, in the former Soviet Union, Russia. Um, and some of them come from places where um, you get punished for saying things by people who are not the government, and the government isn't in a position to stop you, which is the case uh, in Mexico, but also uh, in Colombia and, 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 and numbers of other places. Um, so uh, I think one of the important things that that's a reminder of is that uh, we have two kinds of problem in the world. Sometimes uh, the state is doing too much, but in many places it's doing too little. And you've got to get the balance right between, a, in, as far as the strength of the state is concerned. Uh, many people in, in Africa have suffered uh, over the period of my lifetime from the weakness of the state, not from the strength of the state, from the fact that the state couldn't do things, couldn't protect order, couldn't look after people, couldn't stop you being uh, attacked by uh, people who didn't like what you were saying, uh, rather than uh, being attacked directly by, by agents of the state itself. And that is, it's, um, it's an interesting question which is harder to deal with because uh, in one way, um, States often hold all the cards, and you might think that why on earth should they take any notice? Why should, why should uh, uh, Turkey care that uh, a bunch of writers in New York and a bunch of writers in Norway have sent them a letter about Orhan Pamuk? Why should they care at all? Uh, well, part of the reason they have to care in Turkey is because Turkey is actually a democracy, and they do have a public sphere, and they, while there are problems of free expression in, in Turkey, there is also a vigorous press. Um, but in, in a place like China, where they can close things down if they want to, why should they care at all? And so you might think um, protesting against governments isn't going to do much good. And similarly, you might think um, that um, if, if governments shouldn't take any notice, uh, it's even harder to figure out what you should do in the case where there isn't anybody to address. There is no, I mean, you can write a letter to the drug cartels, you could even publish it in the newspaper, but they're not going to take any notice, right? They, and you have no leverage over them. And yet, one of the things that happens when you do draw attention to these dangers is that uh, even in weak states, you can force the government to... Uh, the, uh, part of the problem with weak states is not that they have no resources, but that they have limited resources and they devote them to certain things and not to others. Uh, one of the things I think you can do is by drawing attention to the weakness of the state, to the fact that the state is failing to protect free expression, even if it's not the direct enemy of free expression itself, is put pressure on the state to decide that it should be spending more of its resources uh, on, on this issue. And sometimes, you know, sometimes that can work. But the point is that uh, so sometimes th there's a kind of um, anti-censorship fundamentalist who thinks that it only matters when the government is doing it. But what matters is whether people can get, can, can express themselves and whether people can hear what's being expressed. Sometimes the, pro the obstacle is the government, sometimes it isn't. And uh, you want a vigorous public sphere. You want people to be able to hear and express themselves. Uh, 
both, as I said, for public reasons, for reasons that have to do with the health of the state, and for these very important private reasons that have to do with the fact that all of us uh, are better off if we have access to uh, a lively world of fiction and nonfiction in order to think about our own lives um, and to think together about our lives. These are this important part of why freedom matters it has nothing to do with the state at all. It has to do with our lives, our lives in civil society, and our lives, our, our most private lives, our intimate lives, our lives at home with our, uh, uh, with our families and friends, and sometimes our lives alone in the study all by ourselves. Uh, so, um, making a world which is sort of safe for those ideas and make sure there's a, uh, making sure there's a, a lively circulation of them includes protecting writers from government, includes protecting writers from, so from uh, an uncontrolled uh, uh, private people. That, uh, the, 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 Russian, um, the Russian journalists I mentioned were almost certainly not killed by, by state officials. I mean, we don't know, but it, they're quite likely just to have been killed by some of the thugs uh, who are associated with, um, you know, with the Chechen situation. So, um, or the problem in Ingushetia. So I think we have to think about it all. And in, and in thinking about it, we must remember that uh, one, you know, among the obstacles to the circulation of ideas worth circulating is, is, uh, has been, uh, as I said, uh, media concentration and the fact that uh, um, in some places, um, well, Put it this way, it's awfully hard to get a biography of Rupert Murdoch published. <laughs> I mean, they have been published. I don't mean it's impossible. <laughs> I've read some of your work in the past on cosmopolitanism, and in listening to you tonight, I think I've come to a somewhat different understanding. And so uh, I want to say, that's the importance of you coming to engage with us uh, in conversation. So thank you very much for coming to Eugene and coming to Oregon. I have a question about um, raising children. Um, and, and the question is whether you've thought of ways in which we as parents, as communities, as societies might go about raising the next generation so that it might more easily engage with and embrace global citizenship and cosmopolitanism. It, it seems, as I think about it, that the major lessons for children have been uh, loyalty to one's peer group, to one's classroom, to one's teacher, to one's parents, one's church, one's sports team, one's high school, one's college or university, mm -hmm. professional sports teams, um, the nation. And so by the time one gets to be 21, 22, 23, there's an enorma, enormous inertia that has to be overcome. But maybe I'm too pessimistic, and maybe you have some uh, a different way of looking at uh, this issue. Well, that's a great, great question. Um, and I have sort of, I guess, three sort of thoughts. One is um, that list of, of loyalties that you acquire as you grow up, one of the good things about it is that they're overlapping. They're not all, they don't all, you know, some of the people who are in your church are not supporters of the Yankees. Thank God. Um, so, um, so it's very important that uh, we can sort of use the full range of our, of, our, of our loyalties in a way to balance each other. That when you're, when you're hyper-focused on your national identity, uh, maybe if you're British, you can remember that there are Manchester United fans in Turkey. And if you're a Manchester United fan, that can be something that links you with people in, in another place. Um, so I think that uh, um, um, as long as we, and I, as I said, I'm, I, I'm in favor of the local loyalties provided there. They, they find their place in a framework which includes a recognition of our obligations to everybody. Um, so that's the first thought is maybe not, so, not quite as bad a situation without intervention as, as you, you, you sketched. Um, but... Um, second thought, yeah, I think we should, we, we have been trying to do more in the name sometimes of multiculturalism, which is sometimes well-intentioned but unhelpful, but we have been trying for a while to, um, to talk to kids in most American uh, public and private schools to some extent about um, 
uh, forms of difference. We've mostly focused on domestic difference because we, we think of ourselves as a, as a very diverse society and we think that everybody who's going to manage life as an American had better be able to figure out how to live in a society with people who are different in, along many dimensions. Um, my own feeling about that is that, uh, as I say, well-intentioned. Um, I think that um, if Americans, and if I may speak as an American who sort of came, has lived in some other places and seen some other options, I think Americans are inclined to exaggerate the substance of the divisions within, uh, the difference within our own society. I, I think that, you know, people talk about language, but, but something like, I mean, somebody did a poll about 10 years ago, something like 99% of uh, people who identified as Hispanic in this poll wanted their kids to learn English properly, right? Now, I challenge you to find anything else that 99% of anybody agrees about. <laughs> Um, so, um, uh, of course, there are lots and lots of differences, and they're real and all that, but the fact is that Americans have lots and lots of things in common, things that they would perhaps notice more uh, if they went together across their differences and spent some time, in, in, even in Mexico, let alone in, you know, Zaire. Um, so, I think we can do things in the content of, of education to cosmopolitanize uh, people. And I would say that we should be clear that that's a separate question from learning how to deal with domestic difference. And there's a tendency to conflate the two. But, uh, and, and, uh, and that's, uh, I think, the trouble with that is that um, <laughs> uh, people in other places are actually more different from, from you than most other Americans in some ways, though, like as most other Americans, you have surprisingly interesting things in common with people from all over the place. There are people who love to fish in every continent, if you like to fish. I imagine many people in Oregon do like to fish. It's a good place to fish. Um, if you, turns out that there are fans of Homer in every continent, and there are fans of uh, Elvis Costello in every continent, and so on. And so people have these amazingly odd, and, and there are people who, have, who are thinking about how to raise children in every continent. Um, so that's, that's a sort of uh, second thing. And I think the third thing is we are doing something now in our college education more that I think is terrifically important. And that is we're actually encouraging people to get part of their education physically elsewhere. Uh, junior years abroad, semesters abroad, and so on. And, and why I think this is important um, for many reasons, but one of the main reasons is to do with an important piece of social psychology, which is this. Um, and this is, a, this is a reason why domestic um, spending time with people of other kinds is important too. Um, the, the social psychological thing is this. Um, if you spend time, especially when you're young, doing some focused thing, which is not focused on transcending difference, but is some other activity, some building a house or, or making a well or whatever, with people who are very different from you, in a way that means you have to rely on each other so that you're mutually dependent and so on, it turns out to be very hard to sustain bigoted attitudes. That's just a piece of social psychology. It's not that people argue the, their way to unbigotedness by these experiences. It's just a fact about people that if you hang out with people and do these things, and th this is a, a version of, of what's called the contact hypothesis in social psychology. Um, it explains, I think, some very interesting, you know, changing patterns in, in, in the world. So I think that that, that exposure is tremendously important. Now, the, here's the question, here's a, uh, the challenge is, we can't send every American kid abroad. There's, there aren't enough places that want them to come. And, and anyway, it'd be too expensive. Um, so can we, can we, can we simulate, uh, simulate this in various ways? Can we, for example, use these new technologies of the web to produce productive, collaborative interactions without actually going to other places? I don't know what the answer is to that in terms of the sort of social psychology, but I think it's worth trying, because I think the more of that we do, the harder it will be to fall into the kind of xenophobic reactions that we're all tempted by sometimes, uh, at least in relation to the people who, uh, some of whom 
you have interacted with in those ways. This takes a bit more time than just a, a, a vacation. It takes, I mean, you know, a weekend or a week. It takes a little bit of time, and it takes an activity, a directed activity. Um, I mean, part of the evidence for the contact hypothesis is things like this, that uh, you, you, take, you take Americans and you put them into the United States Armed Services. Now, the United States Armed Services actively works in anti-racist work, so that's part of the reason why people tend to leave the armed services less racist than they went in. But I believe that they, you wouldn't have to do anything to achieve that effect because people who have spent time together doing some directed thing that isn't itself about building bridges but is a, some third thing, as it were, and who have had to rely on each other, who've worked together in circumstances where you had to trust each other, just lose some of the, 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 the sort of dispositions towards bigoted feelings that, um, you know, we're in all of us if we don't take care. So, um, so I think there are, there are, there's, there's are, there's are three thoughts about, <laughs> about that topic. They're a bit abstract, but I, I think in concretely, um, more exchanges, I think, you know, if you can arrange it and can afford it, having a kid from somewhere else come and spend a vacation, or having your kid spend a vacation. I mean, these are all money-dependent solutions, but then there's quite a lot of money in the United States, so there's nothing wrong with talking about money-dependent solutions. Uh, it wouldn't help in Ghana, because most people in Ghana can't afford to send uh, their kids abroad. Uh, we have to think about other ways. Hello. Hi. Thank you for your talk. Um, so I get the sense that the center is involved, or one of the goals of the center is not just to stop explicit censorship when one sees it, but also a more, um, it, it works towards positively enabling self-expression and um, positively enabling the kind of um, autonomy that's important to cosmopolitan, cosmopolitanism. Um, so I'm wondering about the cultural differences um, within self-expression. So we have uh, sometimes um, maybe the image we have of self-expression is highly individualistic, like one sits down and kind of individually works on a poem apart from social, uh, the enablement of social relations, but maybe in some um, cultures, self-expression doesn't have as individualistic of an appearance as that. And so I'm just wondering kind of how do you um, try to account for the cultural differences um, through which people try to express themselves, or the uh, cultural differences of, lit of the experiment of literature? Um. Well, um, w one sort of, uh, I mean, the big question that you're talking about, which has to do with uh, sort of collective forms of expression, I'm not sure that we have addressed. But there's a, there's a part of that question which has to do with the large amount of work we do uh, in the world of translation. I mean, we're one of the things, when after 9-11, when Salman uh, Rushdie was president of the Pan American Center, and, and one of the things he, he sort of brilliantly realized was that it was tremendously important in that moment to keep us open, not to respond by turning in. And so we started a new international festival and we brought more writers to New York the year after than we had the year before, as it were, in order to uh, sort of keep ourselves open. Well, part of that work is not is no point in bringing uh, a, a, a Turkish writer to to uh, New York uh, if we can't read, since most of us don't read Turkish, mm -hmm. uh, if we can't have access to an English translation. So it's very important. And so we, we have a big translation committee and translation program, and, and we support translations with money from which people have given us. Um, and that, and we encourage publishers to uh, to uh, translate more. Now, uh, much of what is translated is uh, is very recognizable. It's mm -hmm. novels and poems in forms that uh, are you know recognizable to people who read English poetry, mm -hmm. and so on. And so it isn't as stretching as it might be, mm -hmm. but it is sometimes uh, a bit stretching. And I think uh, mm -hmm. we certainly work on that. But as, you know, if, um, if, 
uh, clearly, of course, if, if uh, it turned out that there was, well, I, I can think of an example. Um, one, one of, you mentioned that my, my book was translated into, into various languages, including Korean. Uh, the Korean <laughs> translation of my book was done by four people, hmm. four, four Korean philosophers. Uh, and I have no idea who did what or how they did it. But um, if, if they had come from a country where people got locked up for doing that sort of thing, of course, we would defend them all. <laughs> <laughs> for their collective work, e even though we couldn't identify any one of them as, mm -hmm. as, as the author of it. Mm -hmm. but, um, okay. but, I, but I think it's difficult to, um, there's no doubt that, the, that this thing started uh, in Europe, Penn started in Europe in the sort of, you know, in, in, in the modernist period. And so the notion of the literary was very much the one that you were saying was a local notion, the, the idea of the mm -hmm. sort of individual uh, creative genius resisting, mm -hmm. you know, resisting the temptations to conform and so on. And, um, there's, and that's not how uh, writers everywhere think about what they're doing. Uh, certainly I know uh, that uh, much, um, much post-Second World War literature in Africa published in, in French and in English Definitely not motivated by uh, was was not, was motivated more like some sort of 18th century European literature by sort of nationalist impulses, or by impulses as Chinua Achebe used to say to uh, to to sort of recover a usable past. He, he was often said about the task of of the novels that he wrote in the in the 60s. So um, and that means that but but having access to those novels and to the material around the novels, the interpretive material that comes from reading critical essays and, and, and uh, literary criticism, uh, does, I think, give one access to different ways of thinking about what, what it is to produce a literary work and what you're doing and what, the, what matters about producing literary work. And one of, the, one of the things I think we learn from our festival is that writers in different places have very different notions of the social function of what they're doing, um, uh, of their aesthetic uh, aims, and that's part of the value, I think, of these kinds of interactions. We learn a great deal about the possibilities of literature from seeing people whose personal and cultural uh, context uh, gives their literary work a different, different meaning. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, li 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 literature, right. In other words, uh, uh, the, the, lit uh, the word uh, literature itself is you know, c connected, you know, letters to laws. So my comment, you know, in terms of your larger argument of, uh, of uh, the lecture is, uh, is to address uh, two questions, I think. You know, the first is uh, uh, the recent Supreme Court decision on money uh, as speech. This is uh, number one. And the second one, you know, is the sort of a production of literature as a kind of a culmination of the, uh, of the spread of literacy. And given the sort of a, 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 a tendency in the past 30 years or so that we have a state which uh, is uh, uh, basically investing less and less in public, uh, public education. So how does these two sort of element, the sort of a diminishing of uh, literacy on the nationwide scale, and money as speech affect, uh, you know, your center's, you know, or mission in defending speech, not about against uh, uh, totalitarian regimes, but largely about, you know, uh, uh, liberal democracies. Well, I think that the, uh, no, come down. Uh, the there is a, I mean, uh, I'm not a lawyer. I don't have a view about whether the current uh, interpretation of the First Amendment that the Supreme Court has, has come to by <laughs> majority of one uh, is a reasonable interpretation of the law. That's not the topic on which I'm going to express myself because I don't have any professional uh, competence in that. But, but I think it's a, it's a serious question to think about, which is 
there's a serious question to think about, which is how to structure a, a public world of language and the exchange of ideas to allow citizens to do their political job. There are many other things that literature uh, s functions, as I said, that literature serves, which are not political, and I don't mean to reduce literature to the political, or I don't wish, wish to reduce expression to, the, to political expression, but insofar as we care about, as we should, about the proper structuring of a public sphere in which there can be the genuine circulation of, of the sorts of ideas that citizens need in order to make their decisions, it's a reasonable question to think about whether you want to, uh, 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 to control the ways in which money is used to shape, to shape uh, which ideas uh, get uh, circulated. Uh, that's a re that seems to be a reasonable thing to worry about in a democratic society. It was something we ought to worry about. And democracy was enabled, was made possible in large measure by the growth of certain kinds of public media like, like, the, like newspapers and um, um, broadsheets. Uh, the, the, the growth of democracy in the 19th century, say, in England, the gradual uh, increase of the franchise is connected with the growth of, uh, of means for people to circulate ideas and so on. So I think it's a... It's a and, and so um, the people who wanted to regulate um, uh, the use of money by... Uh, large uh, uh, corporate entities, whether they were unions or, or uh, corporations, uh, were, I think, thinking about something that we ought to think about. And I think it's, it's, not, a, it's not a challenge, to, it's not a threat to free expression if we think about how to shape the ways in which ideas can circulate. It is a challenge if the way in which you want to regulate that is by shutting individual people up. That is by locking individual people up and saying, if you say that, we'll, we'll, we'll lock you up. I think that's something that, we, that I'm against uh, and that Penn certainly has consistently opposed as a way of uh, doing this. And we, we're close to free expression fundamentalists. We, uh, in, 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 in American Penn, uh, but in German Penn, for example, they accept that they have laws in Germany which criminalize um, Holocaust denial and, uh, and the use of uh, Nazi insignia, right? Now, that would be, you couldn't do that in this country. The First Amendment entitles you to, uh, to publish and to read Mein Kampf. Um, uh, and and Pan-American Center is, uh, wh while most of us haven't either published or read Mein Kampf, uh, believe that it's, <laughs> it's important that it should be possible to do both those things not least because you, if you want to understand what happened in the middle of the 20th century, you should probably be allow, allow yourself to read the works of one of the principal agents of what happened. But um, so I think you know there are uh, there are debates within Penn about where these boundaries should lie. Not every Penn Center has the same uh, views about uh, where the boundaries of uh, um, expression lie. We don't all have the same view. For example, again in Europe. Um, in, in, in a number of countries, they have not just libel law, which we regard as a normal way of limiting expression, uh, but they also have group libel laws which, which are responsive to threats to the collective honor of, of groups, which I think the First Amendment probably wouldn't permit in the United States. So there are different regimes in different places. And it's a very important fact, I think, that to say that you're in favor of free expression, uh, nobody who's in favor of free expression uh, thinks that anything that anyone wants to say anywhere, right, they should be allowed to say. Nobody who's sort of thought it through because, um, uh, uh, because there are contexts in which uh, the expression of certain ideas uh, will have disastrous effects. You're not allowed to incite riots, even though you do so by speech. Uh, we can stop you. We can, we can cover your mouth and say, um, if you want to make those arguments, you have to come back when people have calmed down. But while they're while they're while they're in, 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 riled up, you can't you can't say those things, and we'll we'll lock you up if you do, right? So we, we, we there are limitations on on free expression in all kinds of ways. Most places have have limitations to do with indecency, uh, or pornography. Most places regulate pornographic, not just images but speech. Um, so it's it's very important that to, to be permitted to free expression. Uh, is, is to recognize 
I think, that free expression is enormously important and that you have to have very, very good reasons, as I said at the start, for interfering with them. But that there can be such reasons, I think most reasonable people can see. But I don't have a view. Now, on the, on the literacy question, I mean, it's, it's absolutely crucial because the point of, of literature is for readers. Um, it's, not, it's not for the pleasure of the writer that we defend literature. It's because of what literature does for readers. And if people can't read, they're deprived of something that we claim is a very great good. A good, uh, not an instrumental good because it'll help them write memos at their job and get higher salaries, not an instrumental good because it'll make them better citizens, but a good because of the experience of, liter of, of, of fine writing, let's put it that way, the experience of literature is an experience that's a valuable part of a, of a, of a, of a human life. And so denying, uh, making it, uh, and it is denying because we have the resources, we could make sure that all but the severely mentally disabled can read. And so one of the things the Pan American Center does do is we do, we do do some literacy work and we work, uh, we work to encourage expression in schools but also in prisons. We have a prison writers program. And in all of these places, I think both writing and reading, even in, even in prisons, are enormously important part of why literature's uh, valuable. And, I'm, and by literature, I'm deliberately um, privileging um, uh, what, what I'm going to loosely call imaginative writing. Um, journalism is hugely important. I want us to have free journalism and a free press. But if we had a free press and we didn't have freedom of imagination as well, if we just had a free, you know, free newspapers, but no, you know, all novels were banned and all poems were banned, we'd be in deep trouble, I believe. Get the honor. <laughs> Good evening, first of all, and thank you very much for your speech. And I'm a guest here as well, so it's kind of good to be here. Um, I was glad that you brought up the question of Germany and the idea of the fundamentalist position of protecting or defending freedom of speech versus having some limitations of it. Um, because I am from Europe, I'm from Denmark, and what I see happening in Europe at the time being is that the notion of a fundamentalist re, um, freedom for expression is kind of colonized by right-wing populist in a so-called fight against Islam or Muslim people. Um, and to me, it seems like that there's this dubious fact to freedom if in general, but also freedom of expression, which I kind of learned through social psychology as well, that it's always somehow restrained by others. It's not always the way we think, the way we act is always in relation to others and thereby constrained. And my question basically is, I'm thinking a little about the, the so-called cartoon crisis in Denmark. I don't know if everybody's... Um, familiar with that story, um, but what happens, because you have talked a lot about situations where individual writers um, who were in opposition towards the state had to be protected, and I really like that idea of Penn to protect those individuals, but what happened when, when the dominant group um, in a society, when the, their fight for the protection of freedom of expression somehow constrains the freedom of expression of a minority. I'm thinking about, for instance, the socially constrainment of the contain, um, of the containment? No, what do you say? Like, when, when the Muslim community in Denmark expressed their feelings about these drawings, they were kind of socially at least res restrained in their thoughts. And even more so in a country like the Netherlands, where one of the biggest parties at the moment have a head, Gerd Wilders, who was not allowed to come to Britain at some point to show a movie. I'm just talking a lot now, sorry. Uh, but to show a movie that's called Fitna and that has some real, some really um, critical similarities to some of the movies we have seen, for instance, in the Third Reich. And my question is again, like, 
how should we act towards the notion of fundamentalist protection of the freedom of expression that is uttered by the majority towards a minority because Gerd Wilders, for instance, literally wants to ban um, the Quran and other writings. And for instance, he wants to close down all Muslim schools in the Netherlands and thereby kind of constrain their right to express themselves mm -hmm. freely. Sorry for the long. Well, I think the... Uh I think the, the, the key confusion in much of the global discussion of the Danish cartoon events uh, was between uh, questions about, uh, w w and it often comes up in this country too in the context of discussions of the First Amendment, was, <laughs> was, it was a failure to distinguish between two different questions. One question is, um, should it be legally permissible to uh, produce uh, language or images in Denmark that uh, is uh, that that is uh, offensive to um, Muslim sensibilities. Right, that's one question. Should it be legally? Uh, my view is uh, it should not be legally proscribed. The second question is: Is it a good thing to produce uh, language uh, or images whose aim is to inflame Muslim sensibilities? And my answer to that question is no. And that's roughly speaking being the position of the Penn Center on these questions. That this was, uh, we, we, and notice that in the United States where there is no legal reason not to publish these things, is that we don't have any group defamation laws which, would have, which could potentially have been invoked in Denmark, because you do have group defamation laws in Denmark. Um, there's no, the, the New York Times didn't publish those cartoons, right? They, they wrote a story about what had happened. They described it. It was an important event. But they decided that the, the news value of showing the pictures was, less, was not enough to justify they, what they knew would be causing offense to their Muslim readers. Now, that was an editorial judgment. And in, in my view, a perfectly reasonable one. Um, uh, nobody in this country was denied knowledge of the fact that this event had occurred. Uh, there were verbal descriptions of the images available, and actually, if you went on the web, you could find the images themselves if you wanted to. So it wasn't that anyone was denied any, any relevant information, but a decision was made about what was, uh, about respect for a subgroup of readers with a particular sensitivity. Now, I don't think on the other hand, that it was right, just to pick another example in the United States, I believe it was wrong of the Yale University Press to refuse to publish um, those cartoons in an academic monograph that was about this event. I think, I think it was perfectly reasonable for the author of that monograph to feel that in the context, a person who responded to this as an insult when this was a balanced book discussing the significance of the images was being unreasonable, right? That, that would have been my view. And so, and, and as president of Pan American Center, I wrote to Yale University Press and told them that. Um, so I think that these are, these are subtle and difficult questions, and, um, but, the, but the, the fundamental idea that I articulated at the start in talking about what's important about free expression is if you want to shut somebody up, you have to have a good and stated reason. And I believe, I mean, many, you have to remember, as you know, because you're a Dane, that uh, many Danish, uh, the, the fuss in the world about this occurred long after the, uh, the publication, and many Danish Muslims, while they were upset, certainly didn't, uh, you know, uh, rush around attacking people or, 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 or behaving in ways that were suggested they had been provoked beyond all, all measure. Most, most Danish Muslims responded with upset, but in the way that citizens respond when other citizens do things that are offensive. We complain about it. Um, and I do think that uh, I, what I would like to say to, to my Muslim friends is um, you can't expect people who aren't Muslims to refrain from depicting the Prophet. I, 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 uh, people who, uh, uh, to refrain from depicting the Prophet, because we have no uh, direct reason to do so. Uh, two things. One, 
the idea that Muslims themselves shouldn't depict the Prophet is clearly uh, a particular subset of Muslim tradition because I happen to know of many fine representations of the Prophet, for example, in, in the libraries of, uh, of, Constantin of Istanbul. Uh, so uh, the, the, the Prophet has been represented by devout Muslims, and so the idea that a devout Muslim cannot represent the Prophet is a, it's a claim within Islam, just as there are claims within Christianity that are disputed by other Christians. And I don't see why respect for our Muslim fellow citizens should require us to conform to a uh, controversial within Islam claim about what it's proper to depict. On the other hand, I think it's perfectly reasonable for our Muslim fellow citizens to say to us, if you, if you knowingly do something that you know will uh, offend us, then uh, you need to think about that. That's, we don't, we're, we're, civil peace depends upon our not doing that sort of thing. Civil peace in multi-religious societies depends upon developing some degree of thick-skinnedness uh, about your own views and some degree of uh, tact about the views of other people. Imagine what the United, this is now not directed to Danes, but imagine what the United States would be like if every time you sat down next to somebody on a plane, you said, what, what religion are you? And they said, and you said, oh, well, the Methodists. I mean, they hold this ridiculous view. Uh, or, uh, you know, Jews, well, you don't even, you, you, you're 2,000 late with recognizing that the, that the Messiah's already come. Uh, and so on, right? I mean, our society would not be uh, more peaceful uh, if we engaged in that kind of conversation. So I think there's a question of sort of tact, questions of responsible use of language, and, and I, people can distinguish between someone who's saying to them, look, I don't, I think you're wrong. I don't think Muhammad is the last prophet, and here's why. And therefore, I can't accept uh, the demands you make in the name of the Quran. And someone who just wants to be rude to Muslims. Right? They, they, people can, now, there may be boundary cases where people aren't sure which is going on, but I'm saying it's possible to have respectful conversation about these things. It needs context. It needs preparation, in my view. And, um, and I, don't think that the, uh, I don't think that the kind of, oh, you know, we can depict anything we like and, you know, it doesn't matter if the, if the Muslims are upset. It's just a sensible attitude to have in a multi-religious society. So I do not believe that the Danes should change the law in a way to make cartoon representations of that sort illegal. But I do think that uh, I would urge against um, uh, attempts to uh, in inflame the situation in that way. But I'm just one voice. And part of the thing in a free society is that there are going to be people arguing for the opposite. There are going to be people who think that it's tremendously important to offend everybody in order to undermine the importance of free speech. I'm not of that party. I think free speech, is, as I've said, is enormously important. Um, but I think that we should exercise these rights with responsibility.